I was surprised to see this story on BuzzFeed News as one of their trending stories. The title of the article is, She's the public face of Me Too in science. Now critics are speaking out about her tactics. Seven leaders of the Me Too STEM group have resigned, citing a lack of transparency and the founders' combative tweets. Naturally, this is a left-wing activist group focused on Me Too and science, so it's called Me Too STEM. And now they're dealing with resignations and infighting, which is all too common. And what's really interesting is that the BuzzFeed News story even goes into detail about other left-wing groups and their infighting like Occupy Wall Street, the Women's March, Black Lives Matter, etc. So I gotta say, wow, BuzzFeed. I did not think I would see something like this from, from, from you talking about a left-wing group dealing with turmoil and potential collapse. So let's take a look at this story and some of these other references they bring up as to what exactly is going on with this Me Too group. Now, before we get started, go to timcast.com slash donate if you'd like to support my work. There's a monthly donation option, a cryptocurrency option, and of course, uh, there's a physical address. But if you like and comment, it really, really helps the engagement. Share the video if you really like it. And don't forget to subscribe if you want more of the videos like this, even though subscribing doesn't matter at this point. So they say, an outspoken campaigner against harassment in science is facing a crisis of leadership at Me Too STEM, the, the volunteer organization she founded last year to support victims and hold perpetrators and institutions accountable. Since November, seven members of the leadership team have resigned, citing concerns about the behavior of its founder, Bethan McLaughlin, a neuroscientist at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. In their resignation letters, former Me Too STEM leaders said that McLaughlin kept them in the dark about key decisions and reacted with hostility when they asked about the small organization's finances and legal structure. They also worried that McLaughlin had alienated allies through her combative tweets. One of the biggest accusations levied against people in the regressive left, and I don't mean social justice activists, I mean the regressive, you know, left, is that they're doing it for power. And I believe this to be a fundamental truth. Many of the people claiming to be activists are in fact just trying to gain power by playing the victim. So when you hear that someone won't be releasing key information about financials and is attacking even allies on Twitter, it makes you wonder what their true motivations are when it comes to social justice. It should be said in no uncertain terms, social justice is a good thing. Now, hold on. There's a lot of people who you'd you'd call anti-SJW, but SJW, social justice warrior, is very different from social justice. Social justice as a general concept is just the idea that everyone is deserving of their fundamental God-given rights enshrined, uh, well, that, that are inalienable, that exist, but also making sure that the law is fair and just. What we've seen in the past, you know, decade or so, and ever increasingly in the past couple decades, getting worse and worse, is a perversion of social justice. There are many friends that I have that are social justice activists, and I talk about my lefty, my lefty friends all the time. In fact, most of my friends are, and they do not align with these weird groups. These, these, these people are, are perverting and damaging actual justice. In fact, I'd argue anti-SJW types more, are more likely to be actual social justice activists than these regressive leftists. You, and, and I'll give you an example, right? You can't attack someone for being white, penalize someone for being white, simply because you believe white people are better off. Now, I certainly understand the concept of white privilege, and I believe that there's historical imbalances based on race and things like this. I experienced this with my family. But the idea that you would hold an individual to a different standard based on how they look is not social justice. So it's the same is true for when you see feminists attacking men's rights activists. By all means, there are some bad men's rights activists. There are some bad feminists. But at its core, before these ideas get perverted, there's something truthful about the problems faced by both men and women. So the point I'm trying to make here is when I see things like this, somebody who's refusing to talk about finances, someone who's being mean and aggressive, that is not social justice. And it's unfortunate, it really is. Because, you know, look, I'm I'm someone who's kind, I'm I'm moderate. I want to talk about the problems presented in a fair and rational way with good faith. And that means I will engage with a conservative and have an actual conversation. And I'm not blinded by ideology and I'm no zealot, which means my views can be changed with new information as should most people's. But let's, let's, let's keep reading so I'm not, I'm not ranting. There have been several instances where supporters of Me Too STEM have been upset by the tenor of your tweets, up to and including blocking you or being blocked by you, wrote Julie Labarkin, an environmental scientist at Michigan State University, who has compiled the database of more than 770 academic misconduct cases 
and Tisha Bohr, a biology postdoctoral researcher at Cornell University, in their resignation email sent in November. Some of them, victims themselves, have reached out to us for clarification and support, putting us in an impossible position of trying to support victims as well as you and the movement. So let me ask you, if you have a social justice leader blocking, attacking, insulting victims, what does that say about, about some of these groups? Okay. And again, I'm not act, look, absolutely there are grifters on the right. They're anti SW grifters. I've seen videos from some like anti SW types where I'm like, there's no way you actually think that. Come on. You know, and it seems like people just jump on certain opinions. And it's really hilarious though, because some of these people exist. I love it when I see the criticism of me. They're like, Tim Pool criticized Captain Marvel. Oh my God. It's like, oh yeah, some people don't like movies sometimes, but that's how the game is played. They'll look at me. They won't watch the video where I talk about actual, you know, nuance. And it's not just me blindly saying some nonsense. They don't care. They don't. It's all about your tribe is what you talk about. And if you hold an opinion, you're done. But I think there's a reason why I, I, I skirt by many of these weird hit pieces and I think it's because my opinions, honestly, are kind of tepid. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know, people can watch and be like, hey, Tim's all, Tim's all about freedom, but I don't, I don't uh, overtly attack people. I try to avoid, you know, naming people and organizations and things like that because I'm trying to actually engage with these ideas and figure out what's going on and express my opinion in a way that's, that minimizes harm, which, should, which is a tenant of ethical journalism. Don't get me wrong. This is political commentary for sure, but I try. But uh, uh, did I skip over the, uh, yeah, let's, re let's read on a little bit. Um, I'm less concerned with uh, the nitty gritty of what this group is doing. They talk about, you know, some people leaving, some resignations. They say that Me Too STEM was formed after a string of harassment scandals involving leading scientists amid growing recognition that gender harassment is a pervasive problem in science. The rifts within the organization come against the backdrop of a debate about how best to tackle these problems. I think there is an issue in... You know, if you're working in a professional professional environment, it is not appropriate to engage in certain behaviors with women. In fact, actually, I'd say I'd say this. I'm pretty sure any behavior you can engage in in the workplace is probably not okay outside either. That does not include, you know, saying, hey, what's up? You want to go out for a drink or something or complimenting someone's appearance. So we have kind of two extremes. There are people who work in academia, work anywhere, who, uh, men or women, typically men, though, let's be let's be real about it who are going to say things that are inappropriate to women. But that's, that's not the majority of, although you're going to hear about the squeaky wheel, you know, wanting grease in most work environments I've been in, it's, it's few and far between when you have guys who actually do this. Of course, you'll hear women say, no, it happens all the time, but that's the other extreme. When a guy says something like, Hey, that's a, you, you look stunning in that outfit. It's beautiful. You know, a guy compliments a guy's outfit. It's no big deal. A guy compliments a women's outfit and all of a sudden you're, you're entering murky territory. And that's the real issue is trying to define what is or isn't appropriate in the workplace. So what ends up happening then is, you know, actually, I'll put it this way. What we're really doing is trying to figure out where this line is. Is it okay for a man to compliment a man, but not a woman? Well, I think that's not equality. So then is it better that the man doesn't compliment the man either? Can a guy pat a guy on the back? Can a guy pat a woman on the back? No, you like, seriously, you can't. It would be harassment to touch a female. So we're trying to figure out where these lines are. And I believe that's absolutely fair. But we got to make sure we avoid the absolutely hyperbolic nonsense extremes of the squeaky wheels demanding grease. You know, if we really want to figure out how to make a better work environment for everybody and find true equality, we can actually sit down, listen to each other and chill. Unfortunately, there's a lot of loud, angry people who I believe are just using this for power. And that's probably why we see stories like this. But here's what I want to do. They say, me Too STEM is not the first grassroots activist organization to face growing pains. Occupy Wall Street was riven by infighting among its founders. Founders, huh? The Women's March was accused of anti-Semitism. Accused? <laughs> it was published in the New York Times. Black Lives Matter has wrestled with debates over its future direction, and the March for Science formed to protest the Trump administration's science policies added women of color to its leadership in 2017 after complaints that it was neglecting the concerns of minority groups. This is the all too common narrative. The left eats itself. Obama even said it, a circular firing squad. Is anyone listening right now to this, to this segment surprised that once again, we have a high profile story about left wing infighting and people resigning and fighting with each other. In fact, there's one part of the story, which is crazy to me, where someone actually says, I don't know, I, I don't, um, I don't want to 
dig through here and spend too much time reading through everything because the nitty gritty of it is less important. But someone talks about how they have uh, positive experiences with this woman, this woman who's being accused, right, of, uh, of being combative, etc. the leader. They say that their experiences were only positive, but they don't really want to say anything because they don't want to diminish the, the complaints of those who have, je- who have legitimate grievances. Think about that. If we want to figure out if this woman actually did anything wrong, well, then we need people to come up and talk about what's happening. But because some people complained, those who actually liked this woman are not going to defend her because it would delegitimize the complaints of other people. That's the absurdity of, the, of this ideology. No. If someone gets accused and you believe they are of good moral character, you defend them and say, I don't think this is true. I think you might be overreacting. I'm going to defend this individual. We're at a point now, though, where people won't speak up against the grifters on the left because they're like, yeah, but it would diminish the legitimacy of those who are actually complaining. And there you have it. It falls to the oppression Olympics. Whoever is the most aggrieved, the most perceived to be oppressed will be allowed to speak and no one else can because it would be diminishing a legitimate complaint. That's absurd. It doesn't matter what you are, who you are, where you come from. You have a right to your opinion, be it positive or negative. I remember this Huffington Post uh, uh, live segment where an Asian woman told a white man, the host, something like, you know, you're, you're, you're interrupting me and, and you shouldn't have an opinion on, on this issue because you're a white man. And he says, I can have an opinion on whatever I want. And he called her an idiot or something. It was hilarious. But it's true. Yes, everybody has a different perspective. People experience the world in different ways. Did you know that there could be a tall Asian person who has more privilege than a, a white short person? You can't judge someone based on their looks because you, can, you, you can't quantify privilege beyond like really simple things. And all that ends up happening is people keep complaining about everything until you end up with like a, 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 a queer transgender, you know, immigrant Muslim who's disabled. You know, it's like, it's just like, at what point, at what point do you stop and say, no, 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 no. We, we understand you're, you, you know, you fit all these different intersectional issues. We'll listen to you, but we're going to listen to these people too. And we're going to express our opinion, opinions as well. Like wh- when do we get to that? You, you don't because there's no reason among the extremes. And this is what ends up happening. So no, there's a reason why after thousands of years, we ended up with a legal system we have today. And I think we've done a pretty damn good job. You know, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm brain farting on the, what, what we call it, but uh, 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 English common law, I believe. It's the, it's the root of a lot of how we handle justice, presumption of innocence, right? It is better that, was it 10 guilty persons escape than one innocent person suffer? That means I am not going to hold back my evidence against an individual because someone's accusing them. No, if someone accuses you, and you have some circumstantial evidence to counter that, by all means, bring it up. But now we're entering a period where it's just believe the victims and give the victims whatever they want. So then all someone has to do is claim to be a victim to get whatever they want. That makes literally no sense. And it'll bring about nothing but tyranny and, dare I say it, fascism. Fascism. An authoritarian system where the evil people, the sociopaths, don't care to lie and play the victim to get what they want. This doesn't make any sense. Is this bringing justice for anybody? No. Is this woman who is leading this group deserving of being ousted and attacked? I don't know. Some people are saying they don't want to speak up because some people are speaking up and it makes no sense. But hey, there you go. Once again, another story about the left eating its own. Let's read the conclusion and carry on because I feel like this is something I'd rant too much about. But uh, and then this is a big story. It was a correction on it. They say the volunteers who have left me to stem said that they are still committed to its wider goals of supporting victims. I believe that STEM would greatly benefit from having an organization or more than one with the goals of fighting harassment and discrimination. My hope is that we can learn from this experience to make a stronger and more inclusive community intent on battling harassment. Well, I don't think you can, because what happens when you fight yourselves and no one defends you? What happens when you get, you know, it's a circular circular firing squad. These groups are such at odds with each other. This is what's going to happen. And that's how it's going to be. You will start a group. You'll say, hey, let's fight X. And then someone will be like, I accuse you of Y. And then your group's gone because that's the rules you play by. Uh, whatever. I'll leave it there. Thanks for hanging out. Stick around. I got another segment coming, another story coming up. Um, main channel, youtube.com slash TimCast at 4 p.m. For those on the podcast, I do change the order of a lot of these segments. So bear with me, but that'll be starting soon. For everyone else, I will see you. At, I will see you then.